Um, we're just going to ask each of them to do that for about three to five minutes. And then after that, we will take questions that you have and uh, we'll spend lots of time in. So, Dr. Powderman, would you like to start us off? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, hello again. So, um, I am a pediatrician in Fort Worth. Um, for the last two years, I have been in private practice, but previous to that, I um, was a hospitalist at Cook Children's, which means I um, only took care of kids that needed to be admitted to the hospital. Um, really, in the last few years, um, we have really kind of had to change our practice style um, because of the um, emergence of e-cigarettes. Um, I think um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, number one, now that we are in the middle of cold and flu season and we see so many kids coming in respiratory illnesses, I think a change in practice has been addressing whether or not um, kids are vaping. And that's a, that's a very kind of tricky topic to kind of bring up um, to kids and to parents. I have even some parents um, ask me about um, how to know if their kids are vaping. So that's kind of a that's kind of a hard thing to know because it, it kind of mimics so many different things, right? It can mimic the flu. It can mimic someone who has asthma. Uh, usually, when kids are not getting better with the things that we're doing, that's usually when I try to start questioning if other things are going on. Um, when I talk to parents in my clinic about recognizing whether or not their kids are vaping, I ask them actually to go into their rooms and to look around. Because if you know anything about teenagers, usually their life result revolves around three to four feet around them. And so simply going in and looking at their, their floor around their bed or around their desk, you'd be surprised about the amount of things that you can find around there. And so if you have a lot of USB ports, if you have a lot of strange odors that you can't detect that are not plug-ins, you know, be honest with us, that's okay, uh, because they're scared. But one of the things that I think that we see is not just the respiratory aspects of this, which I'm, you know, concerned about. And when I talk to, when I go out and I talk to kids about uh, e-cigarette use, I actually try and focus on what can happen to them. And it's not bringing up the black lung of you know, that we used to have with cigarettes and say, don't smoke, this is gonna to happen to you in 50 years. Because honestly, we don't know what's gonna to happen to these kids in 50 years, right? To their brains or to their lungs. What I like to do is bring out pictures of kids who have put their stories out there publicly about how they've been affected by vaping. And Cooks did a great job of talking with the family and they agreed to put out pictures of their child when they were in the ICU this last summer and shooting that picture up in front of children and going through every single tube that is going through that child is much more impactful. It's just that. They don't appreciate the consequences because it's downplayed as not as bad as smoking. And then um, um, they are much more tolerant of it because of the smell. You know, I once asked my son when he said, oh yeah, I went into the bathroom, there's like four boys vaping. And I said, don't you want your bathrooms back, dude? I mean, don't you want them back? And he's like, well, it doesn't smell bad. It doesn't smell bad. And so that's why when we're talking about flavoring and all of those kind of things, why this is so important for them, okay? Um, my name is Anna Carey. I'm 17 and I'm a dual credit student at TCC. Um, I started vaping three years ago as a freshman. Um, I immediately was addicted. And something I really want to make uh, clear is that addiction is a gene, so not everyone is going to be addicted. The people that stop and um, have heard my story multiple times, um, when they stop with no help, they're usually not addicted. Um, and if they do stop, they usually go to back to school and it makes them start again because it's rare to not have anyone that isn't doing it. Um, I started because it was cool, it was a form of self-medication, I just didn't really think anything of it. At that point there was nothing out on like it being harmful. Um, but not many people did it three years ago. Um, I lost a couple middle school friends, um, but I didn't really care. I got it from seniors, it wasn't hard. I definitely tried to fill up my own pods, but I didn't succeed. 
Um, summer going into my sophomore year, I stopped because I didn't have a source. Um, then my sophomore year happened and it skyrocketed. Everyone was doing it. I really didn't know anyone that didn't vape and it was a lot easier to get. My parents even knew um, that I was vaping and I would get in trouble consistently. I was always grounded. They made me write articles about vaping to try to get me to stop. She took away my makeup. They really tried everything to get me to stop and I just wouldn't. I tried to stop multiple times though and I was not successful. I, there's no program to help me and there's like there's just no way to stop because the withdrawals were so bad and also everyone at school was doing it. Um, I would go to the bathroom every class period to do it too. Um, it was like a joke between some of my teachers that like I would go to the bathroom every class period. They didn't know why. They just thought it was because I was trying to get out of class, but it's because I was vaping. Um, I figured out that I needed ten dollars every three to four days, so I was always broke. And now I only know, like in present day, I only know a few people that don't vape. Even people that visit me in the hospital, they still vape because they're addicted. Um, people either have a vape or they use one at school. I really don't know anyone that's just like, no, I don't vape. There's a few people, but it's not common. I left my regular high school because of vaping. It was my entire reputation. I wanted to escape that, but then I was homeschooled and I could vape all the time now. A month before I was hospitalized, I was having some random pains in my chest. So I um, went and got an x-ray and it came back clear. Then a week before I was hospitalized, I was all of a sudden struck with immediate exhaustion, uh, like a brick on my chest. I like, it was so hard to breathe. So I laid in bed a couple of days and then finally we decided to go to the hospital and they cleared me. I did an uh, x-ray and an EKG and they both came back clear. I, they said nothing was wrong with me. I left the hospital just as I came. Um, so then the next couple of days I laid in bed. At that point I was only vaping like three times a day so that I could just feed the addiction. But I really cut down because I knew that's why I was having these pains. Then um, I went to a basketball game with my friend and I went up hills and stairs and did like sang songs in the car and I couldn't do anything because I was so out of breath. So then the next day I went to urgent care and then they sent me to another hospital and then I was ambulance to Cook's Children where they diagnosed me with chemical pneumonia. It was the worst pain I've ever felt in my entire life. I could not breathe. I needed oxygen to breathe. I couldn't like go to the bathroom without using oxygen. I couldn't do any physical activity at all. Um, so as I said, some of my friends still do it, but it's because they're addicted um, and there's no programs or resources to help them stop. I've talked to them countless times. They're tired of me talking about it because I'm so against it and I did a full 180. But um, the people that aren't addicted are the people that stopped. And so that's where I think the numbers come from. Um, I think that every kid really should hear that talk just now, but at the same time, we just need give, showing them my story and just giving them so many different like ways to scare them isn't going to help them. They need like a reason to stop, a way to stop. So I think in the conclusion, I just think that everyone needs a solution to stop. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Barnett. I'm actually an associate professor with the UNT Health Science Center in the School of Public Health. Um, I've been studying tobacco for many years. I actually studied hookah before e-cigs hit the scene. Um, so I try to keep up with what all the teenagers are up to. Um, I want to kind of switch a few things. I do think it's really important that we focus on the fact that one in four high school, or high school students have reported that they're using it. But another way to talk to your kids is that three to four aren't. We have to, as adults, understand that this is an epidemic. I'm not trying to minimize that. But there's also something called social norms theory. And we're telling them everyone's doing it. The teenager hears that as everyone's doing that except you. No teenager wants to be the one who's not doing something. So we also have to find a way to switch it. We know that when kids overestimate who's doing something, they're then more likely to do it. So we also have to flip our conversation and see if we can't use that as one way that we can kind of start curbing and reducing. Um, like was mentioned before, I also don't go long-term consequences. Not only do we not know them, but that just doesn't work for the teenage brain. Telling them something's going to happen to them at 40 and 50, they don't even even think it's a reality. Not that they have this death wish, but they're like, I'll never be that old. Of course you will. Um, but we can't get them to think like that. So you've got to go short-term consequences. The other thing we haven't talked about yet are explosions. Um, there aren't as many, but these things also explode. They have batteries that turn on in jean pockets. 
I often get the boys' attention when I point out that when it explodes in your pocket, there's usually quite a bit of damage. That gets their attention. <laughs> it's important to talk about short term. That gets their attention. Um, long term just doesn't work. So this is the way in which we do it. I also, you know, in a room of adults, we do have to talk about what's scary. But again, I have to tell you, that doesn't really work all that great with kids. If they've already had experience with it, and that bad thing you just told them about didn't happen, you're already discredited. And remember the reefer madness of the, madness of the 70s? We all kind of went, okay, sure, it didn't happen. That's how kids think. They've already had positive experiences. We've got to be able to turn it around about the positives and not just, oh, but this will hurt you. It kind of goes in one ear and out the other. And I have kids too. I see the glazed look at my own kitchen table. Um, I think there are ways to do this. Uh, we saw a graph at the very beginning. In 2009, we did pass some awesome legislation. It's why we saw cigarette use go down. We got rid of flavors. We got rid of advertising. Direct-to-consumer advertising had to go. Characters that attracted kids had to go. And suddenly, cigarettes went down. Tobacco companies are anxious, right? They need customers. That's what we've seen come back with e-cigs. That doesn't have to be the way this is. If we would just attack these flavors again and well beyond just the Mod Pod, but the flavors and the consumer marketing alone would help us reduce some of these issues. Um, raising the age helped. I'm proud of Texas for doing that. 21 helps get things out of high schools. It just works. 18-year-olds can flood high school with things. 21-year-olds really don't hang out with 15-year-olds very often, thankfully. Um, I still want us to focus. I think our talk was awesome today but the tobacco companies are really who's pushing these on our kids. And we really have to stay focused and keep working very hard against our tobacco companies. Um, they're the ones who need new customers. They're the ones who have all the old tricks and how to get our kids addicted. And that's the messaging that we keep needing to talk to our kids about. Obviously, I'm aware that they can still be modified but other things can be put in, but those are the ones really coming after our kids. Um, he brought up Altria didn't bring up the fact that when they bought only 35% of Juul, that resulted in $13 billion. That was over 2 billion bonuses for about 1,500 employees. A lot of people got rich off our kids' lives. That's the message we need to keep talking about. The Truth Initiative worked with kids. We told them this about the tobacco companies with cigarettes. We told them they think you're puppets. They think you're dumb. That gets their attention. They don't like hearing that. We got to do it all it's the same as they're doing all their old tactics. We've got to use those same tactics again to say they think you're dumb, they need you, they're the ones trying to get you. That's really actually the way to go, I think, when we talk to kids. Right. I think that um, my name is Nicole Collier. I served in the Texas legislature. Uh, and I want to touch upon, I just want to bring it back to what Dr. Stout was talking about. He really brought it home that we don't know what are in those cartridges. I mean, we just don't know what they're putting in. And so one of the things that the Department of State Health Services, I want to thank them for a lot of information that they brought. I brought some brochures from them. You know, e-cigarettes have been around since 2007. They've been for sale in the United States since 2007. And Dr. Amanda Hall, uh, Associate Commissioner of Community Health Improvement with the Department of State Health Services, um, has said that, you know, even though cigarette smoking for youth has been on the decline, e-cigarettes, use has quadrupled basically I mean since uh, over over time so we've seen cigarette smoking decrease but the use of e-cigarettes has increased so from uh, 3% in 2012 to 13% in 2018 that's what we're seeing our youth and as a result of that uh, we have seen uh, 304 possible cases of pulmonary uh, respiratory uh, illnesses um, and so we have 123 confirmed cases, 116 are classified as probable, and four deaths have been reported in Texas. Um, and 23% uh, of those cases are under the age of 18. So, and 72% of those people are, are, are male. Uh, and 90% of those cases are uh, available, are substances reported with, uh, VH, uh, with THC in those vaping products. So, um, that's alarming. That's alarming. And let me tell you uh, why that's alarming. 53% of those, over 53% of those were in our region, of those cases were in our region. Um, and let me tell you this, uh, we're, we're working on this at the state level. Um, D, uh, the Department of State Health, and, uh, state Health Services 
is working on a multi-million dollar campaign um, to combat uh, the use of tobacco. If you go to the dshs.texas.gov uh, forward slash vaping, uh, you'll find a lot of information about what they're doing. We have a Say What campaign uh, that they're working on. It's www.tx www.txsaywhat.com. You'll find out more information about what the Department of State Health is doing. We also have the Yes Quit campaign. Um, there's so many other programs that the Department of State Health is doing. Uh, there's other state agencies that are working on this. The Texas Comptroller, the Lieutenant Governor is working on other programs. Um, uh, there's some legislation that we're working on. The Texas Ag Education Agency is looking into this. And as the chair of the Criminal Justice C uh, Committee, I'm looking at this. Now, look, I don't want to look at this as a criminal justice issue. I want to look at this as the public health epidemic that it is, all right? Uh, we already have enough youth in our uh, Texas criminal justice system. We don't want to look at this as that issue. Uh, we raised the age, yes. Uh, the federal government has even stepped in and said that this is a, a, a issue that you have to be 21 to purchase all tobacco products. There's no, you know how we did in Texas, we did the military exception? Well, that's invalid now. That's invalid now, according to the federal, um, the federal, you know, ban now. Now you have to be 21. So, since we, we talked about uh, the criminal justice system, but, but let me tell you this. Someone who has, since we're, we're finding out that a lot of these vaping products, we don't know what's in these vaping products, but we found out they have, a lot of them have THC in this. So there's a difference between uh, criminal penalties when you have, you're caught with marijuana versus THC, all right? So if you are caught with marijuana, that could be a misdemeanor. But if you have, uh, and it could be if it has a p penalty possession if you have under an ounce. But if you have any amount of THC, it starts at a state jail felony. Now if you are on or within 1,000 feet a restricted zone. Now a restricted zone could be a school, a daycare center, uh, it could be near uh, a daycare center, um, a playground. That bumps it up to a third degree felony, which is two to ten years in jail and up to a $10,000 fine. All right? Now, what I'm talking about, it starts at a felony. Now, you go, you have a felony on your record. That talks, you talk about uh, with your record, if you have a record of a felony, and it impacts your ability to get a job, impacts your ability to get in college, it impacts your ability to go into the military, it impacts your future. So, we're talking about somebody with a vaping pen, something, and it has TH, any trace amount of THC is going to impact their whole life. So what I'm talking about, when we're talking about how we're going to do this, let's talk about how we can start looking at this as a disciplinary matter within our schools. So let's approach this. I, I'm not saying that uh, you don't take it to the law enforcement, but let's look at ways that we can have alternative ways of approaching this. So I, I like what Anna was talking about. She said something about you know, giving resources and tools to the students uh, who are in, in going through these uh, things. So, you know, don't just say stop. Uh, I mean, we're seeing varied approaches to this throughout the state. You know, different school districts are, are handling it in different ways. You, I've seen the zero tolerance method. I've seen a hybrid method. Um, but let's look at this. I mean, she's already said, we need resources. We need help. Uh, but I'm not saying people shouldn't be accountable for their actions. But let's give them those resources as well. So, you know, as we um, sit here and talk about this, I think that that's some of the things that we're going to discuss later on. Let's talk about these hybrid methods of how we're going to approach this. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the state, we don't have the man. We, make, we, have, we have beds there. We have seats at the Juvenile Justice Center. But do we want to put these first-time offenders down there with those um, people who, who are, you know, supposed to be down there with the violent offenders, you know, that, that's what they're, you know, geared towards. Um, but when we're, you know, we really want to educate these students on, on, you know, how to make better choices. So that's all I got to say about that. Thank you all so much. I mean, what an amazing panel of people. 
I mean, amazing brains here. They can really help us understand. So this is the time to get your questions answered. But while you're thinking about your questions, I'd like to um, ask Toby Jackson to join us. She just came in the room, came from the school board meeting, and I think some exciting things happened there. They did. Well, why don't you tell us about them? Okay. The most exciting thing was I got to see Dr. Guda Metla, and when I saw him in the audience, I decided, Toby, they hear you talk a lot. Let's let Goody talk. So I did it. Um, the second thing is we passed this resolution tonight, 9-0. So that's the first step, and the city council will do it in just, well, it depends on how much public comment they have, but probably within the hour. So Fort Worth had two landmark resolutions passed to support the education of students with regard to e-cigarettes. And we need to get the attention of not just the people in this room, because I see too many familiar faces here, right? But we've got to get the attention of the people that don't know we need their attention. So that's the purpose of these two resolutions, and that's the, the first start, step. The second step is going to be tonight when we develop the community action plan here. And I want to thank everybody on the panel and my state rep that I actually get to vote for. Uh, <laughs> state rep Nicole Collier was instrumental in getting Dr. Stout here. And, and I sure want to thank her for that. I want to thank Dr. Tracy Barnett that always comes out and helps us. Anna for being so brave. I have heard you speak now twice and I'm always amazed at your poise. I think she's really 35. <laughs> and, and, and Dr. Kathleen Powderly, not only a two decade pediatrician here, but also the president of the 501c3 that I'm fortunate to be the executive director of Fort Worth Spark. And Dr. Peter Stout, I do not know you, but I heard great things. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is the time when you can ask questions. Any question that you'd like to ask, we'll start right here. Hi, my name is Idria. Um, I am with Tarrant County Public Health, so I'm here for vaping. Um, one thing Tarrant County Public Health does is something what we call Team Video Fest. It's a health video contest for teens to speak out on health issues that surround teen health. And this year's one of this year's topic is vaping, which is why we're here. But my question then becomes: as adults, as parents, we can say we know we know best, right? Because we keep our kids' interests in mind. However, that's not always the case when we say, do our kids listen to us? That's a whole nother deal, right? How many times have your kids said, I know better. I, I, I'm still in school, I know, I see, right? And my, so my question is for you, Anna. I know you say that resources would be great to help out um, trying to get kids to stop vaping. What do you think those resources look like? We have, I mean, the truth, hot, there's an addiction hotline already out there that teens are not technically using tons of. They are using it, there are statistics that say they are, but it's not tons. So there are some resources. What additional resources would you like to see that would allow other teens and to hop on this train and say, I do need help? Because we as parents can say, look, you need to stop. But that's not always gonna, they're not gonna listen to us and vice versa. So what do you think that resource really needs to look like? Great question. Um, I know I, a lot of my friends are, use, are using the costs is um, the number that texts you every day, like reminding you to stop and giving you like, leave it at home one day of the week. And um, I think, honestly, I don't know, but I know that it's, I keep emphasizing that it's an addiction. It's like there's AA groups for, um, and there's NA, and there's like all these other groups for <clears throat> other addictions, so why isn't there like something that's gonna help for nicotine addiction, because withdrawals are bad, like it's just the same. So that's what I mean by like resources. Any other, anyone else have a comment on that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> this may be an easy answer or a hard answer, it's for each of you. When I call my 22-year-old college student son tonight who vapes recreationally, what's the one sentence each of you would say that could make the most impact when I call him tonight? Good question. Some some basically something around to do to your sucker. I mean I'm so I've got a I've got a I've got a twenty year old and you know Having been a 20-year-old male myself, the suggestion from my mother that I might be too dumb to recognize that I'm getting used, that might go somewhere. 
I, I agree with Dr. Stout, and I think that probably Dr. Barnett's going to probably say the same thing, is, is that good job spending all your money. Yeah, not much, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I'm just going to say almost the same thing. Um, the hospital bill. Mm. The tobacco companies think you're dumb. They own you, they're not using this stuff, but they're making money off you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't ask me for any more money. <laughs> you know what, that, that's crazy because my daughter just asked me for $10 before. <laughs> she asked me to sell $10, now I'm thinking, what was it for? <laughs> she told me it was for gas. <laughs> resources for kids and I might kick this to poor Dr. Powderly but it's nicotine replacement therapy is not approved for kids under 18 so we also maybe have to work with some pharmacists and pediatricians who maybe are seeing the gray area and how to approach this because right now it's not approved but your son should probably if you really when he gets to the point that he wants to quit he's going to want to consider patches or some approved way because you don't just wake up one morning and decide it's not anymore it hurts so for the first time in my career, I have prescribed a, a nicotine patch. Um, so it, you're right, it's not approved. We do many things that are not necessarily approved as under a doctor's care. Um, unfortunately for us, there's not a lot of, actually a lot of great studies out there. As in most of pediatrics, we don't have a lot of great information. But um, we do know that um, we feel like we can control that nicotine amount in a, in a safer way than we can with them continuing to use e-cigarettes. So, you know, unfortunately, this is an anecdotal thing that we are now kind of immersed in because there's not a lot of studies in using this. Um, but I know that that progression, some people will not do it. Um, you know, seeing the effects of nicotine withdrawal in some of these kids is devastating. It, they look horrific and they feel horrific and you can see why would they would go back to using again. So I think that that's something in pediatrics that is on our horizon of things that we're gonna have to look at and we might have to step out of our safety boundaries just to kind of figure out ways to help these guys until we can figure out more permanent solutions. While well, I'm walking to the next question, um, right here. The Heart Association recently announced that nationwide we are putting $20 million into research for nicotine addiction in teens so that we can figure out what we need to do to keep them from being addicted but then to reverse this epidemic. So it won't happen tomorrow but hopefully within a few years we will have some real results and know what to do. So I'm just wondering where you can get the information you talked about, what's in it, you talked about the, the main ingredients, because I texted my 29-year-old son, said, do you know anybody who does his vaping? And he said, yeah, and I said, you know, the main ingredient is, is antifreeze? He said, there's no way that's true. <laughs> of course so, <laughs> yeah, you know, show me the science, right? Where do, where, what kind of resources can you point him to that show him the disgusting things that are really, and the risks of the things that are in it? Um, and trying to think of a good place to read, I mean, literally, if you, if you Google, Vape juice recipes. Yeah. Um, I mean, they talk openly about it's propylene glycol, it's glycerin, and it's, this is one of the seductive, just basically all face lies of the industry is they have gone about saying these are FDA approved. Well, yes, they are. As food additives for consumption, mm -hmm. not 
freebasing them. The other thing that they don't point out is many of these um, flavorants come in ethanol. So you're freebasing ethanol too. And the funniest idea what that's going to do to you. But if you, I mean, any of these things they talk about is propylene glycol. Google propylene glycol. One of the main things is antifreeze. I mean, I've got a picture of it. You can take a picture of it. You can, you can take this. I'll go to the auto parts store and get another jug. <laughs> it's, it's what it is. It says it on the label. Yeah, it's on the box. It's propylene glycol. Google what propylene glycol is. Wow. What other questions? We have a follow-up. Yeah. I was just going to ask, how to, if propylene glycol is, is poison, how is that approved? So the part that's easy to get confused with, <coughs> ethylene glycol is the antifreeze that you typically think of that's in your car. And yes, that is toxic because if we as mammals consume it, we metabolize it to something that forms crystals in our kidneys and that damages our kidneys. Propylene glycol, you can consume it and it doesn't do that. So if you look, um, some sodas have it as an additive, it's added as a food stable, <coughs> and, things. and in winter ease that you know your grandparents put in the crapper in their RV in the winter. I mean, I don't sure I really want to eat it either, but it really, we have no idea what it does in the world. You're also taking this stuff and you're heating it up. You're heating it up on a um, wire that contains heavy and also rare earth metals that are in there. So there's chemistry going on in these things that causes that to form big long chains. We have less idea what's going to happen with those. So this seductive thing that dude with the bad hair dye in the corporation is saying, don't worry, it's all FDA approved. Well. Maybe term deleted. No, it's not approved to freebase this stuff. And in answer to you, they're not fully approved. These aren't fully regulated and approved yet by the FDA. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, the problems is, is that there is so lack of regulation with the there is such a lack of regulation of all these components together inhaled. So a lot of separate components are approved for separate things but not together and not inhaled. Yeah, inhaled. Right. And so what I try to explain to people when we're talking about this glycol, because it just seems like it's this thing out here, is once you heat it up and it goes into your lungs, once it cools down again, that's what gets people in trouble, is because it's kind of like fat in your lungs. And we don't do so well unless you have air in your lungs. When you get fat in your lungs, that's when you really are struggling to breathe. And that's what it's kind of akin to. But that's the problem that we have, is we don't have any regulation of these all together in this one component. So, so FDA has been asleep at the switch on this one. And because, again, these industry manufacturers that are making a crap ton of money off of it, have pitched these things as a safe alternative to smoking. Smoking, hands down, smoking is a horrible thing, kills half a million people a year still. So yes, the prospect that there might be a smoking cessation technology that could improve that has perked up the FDA's ears. Well, in the process of doing that, they have punted some of the requirements that will be placed on <coughs> e-cigarettes to demonstrate efficacy, to demonstrate safety. They pushed it down a number of years. So they have given the industry a free pass on demonstrating the safety of this stuff for years because they don't have the resources. CBD, the same thing. Basically, CBD, there is only one FDA-approved preparation called Epidiolex for the treatment of two very specific childhood epilepsy symptoms. That is the only preparation of CBD that is legal for human consumption or animal consumption. There is anything that you would eat inhale, consume, stick up your nose, or anything else that contains CBD is not strictly speaking legal, but the FDA is completely overwhelmed. They have no prayer regulated. This is completely unregulated. So I have the next question. Um, it's probably for Nicole, actually. From an enforcement perspective, um, <coughs> How does the future legalization of marijuana impact the priority for dealing with vaping and the CBD regulation? 
Um, we have several friends who are handlers for police, fourth place for the police dogs, and they are no longer training the dogs on marijuana because soon it will be legalized theoretically and those dogs if they trigger for marijuana first then they're out of service because it's not going to be a drug that they're technically tracing for and so how do you see that impacting your the work of trying to regulate vaping because it's not going to be the priority Was there anything? would you like to take that i just i want to make sure i understood the question yeah. uh, legalization of marijuana if that becomes, I know that there's a large concern even in West Texas with the large family farms becoming large marijuana farms there, that the law enforcement priority turns there and the regulatory priority legislative, how do we manage this huge impact of that while this is going on with the kids? It's kind of like the shell game going on. Are you, are you talking about hemp? You mean the, the farmers who are growing hemp? Yeah. Versus, okay, so hemp, uh, so it, House Bill 1325, uh, will allow farmers to grow hemp, which is supposed to have 3% of hemp. It has to have THC. It has to, the level of THC has to be 3% or less of THC. Um, and so that is what, it's the, it's the federal farm bill. Now this is something that everyone has to understand. The federal government has not legalized marijuana. So all the states that have legalized marijuana, this is something that people have to remember. Every state that has legalized marijuana, the federal government has not legalized it. So all the people who have marijuana money, putting it in the bank is still a crime. Putting it, your drug money in a federal bank is still a crime. So those people are committing crimes still. So I, I, there's still problems with putting your drug money into federal banks. So I, I think that you still have that hurdle that you have to get over. Even if we were as a state to legalize marijuana, which is something that I have voted for. I voted to decriminalize it. And I, I chair the Criminal Jurisprudence Committee. I passed that bill out of the House Committee. Uh, it was to decriminalize because that was just so that you can get a Class C misdemeanor. Um, uh, but you still would have gotten a ticket. Uh, we still would have had the hurdle. Uh, of people getting tickets and, and they would not have legalized it, but still, you would have that issue. But with the farm bill, uh, with the hemp, it is causing problems because uh, you cannot just smell it, the difference between hemp and marijuana. Uh, now law enforcement and the dogs cannot tell the difference, and so that is causing some issues, and so we are studying that during the interim over the issues and uh, over this uh, interim before the next session. And Dr. Stout has uh, brought that to my attention, uh, that there are issues with the labs, uh, testing the difference between um, hemp and marijuana. You have to have special equipment to be able to tell the difference between 0.3 and 0.5 and, and, and so forth of, uh, of uh, detecting what, what the, I guess, the THC level uh, and the marijuana uh, versus the hemp. Um, and, and so those are posing problems, that is true. And so in terms of THC, uh, it doesn't matter whether you have THC or, or not in schools and vaping. If you have THC, you are being charged, period. Wait, you, sure. Sure. Your, your question about if, if we don't figure out vaping before you see more changes in marijuana, my kid, Peter's new in the world. Uh, if we don't figure out the vape thing and figure out how to get this in hand, it's there's going to be a coincidence that's going to create an even larger issue. Mm -hmm. Because what we see in states that have truly legalized marijuana, really what has been legalized isn't marijuana. It is the commercialization of THC and CBD. So really, it is a corporate, it is a very deliberate corporate strategy because it's just like the tobacco industry really is about delivery of nicotine. Same thing with the cannabis industry is the delivery of THC and CBD. They want vape there because it is the preferred mechanism for the consumption. So if we don't get a handle on vape as and there's some really beneficial things that could, I, I, I don't know. CBD may actually have some really beneficial things. There's some stuff that suggests it may be really beneficial. <laughs> really don't know. And 
if we don't have control, if we don't have a better understanding, if we don't get this, basically, well, you know, kids get hooked on the stuff because of nicotine, it's going to explode with marijuana because then it's going to be about THC and CBD and CBP and CBN and the other 104 cannabinoids, and it's going to be a field issue. I just have a question for Dr. Stout. Uh, what are the risks of like secondhand vaping stuff in the air? I mean, like those kids walking into the restroom where there's a lot of vaping going on. And Logic would say there's a significant risk. I have the foggiest idea. There is really nothing that gives us any idea of how much or how little risk is there. The concentrations of what you're talking about in these things certainly would be consistent with that being a real problem to you. Inhaling this stuff, but I don't know. I think this is our last question here before we move into groups. So um, I think we'll take a last question and then maybe a final thought from each one of you. Would that be okay? Um, my question's for Anna. I'm a high school nurse. <coughs> so if I had a student come, in, I try to ask them if they're coughing a lot, do you, you know, do you smoke e-cigarettes? Um, but if I had a student come to me and be honest, and say that they do, and they want to stop, but they can't, what would you recommend I say to them? Um, I mean, definitely, if they're reaching out to you, then they like, I, I think a lot of people right now, unless they're just like uneducated, um, I think a lot of people right now do want to stop and there's just literally no way to because they're not going to go through withdrawals, that's not worth it. And no, their family doesn't know either so they're not supporting them when they're getting angry for no reason. That's one of the main withdrawals that is so bad. Um, so I don't, I think keeping them accountable rather than being like you need to stop and also showing some resources like there's different techniques that like people say you can do like snapping a rubber band on your wrist every time you want to do it drinking water um there's different things that they say could help but i don't have a good set so i mean you got hospitalized so that was sort of your kick in the oh for sure in your butt to, to do it yeah um and that's something that i think we don't want that to happen and they want to stop now maybe they read your story on facebook because i remember reading um, somewhere I read it. Um, and so, what resources help you besides being told by the doctors and your family that you had to stop? I mean, you had to stop. Right. Um, I mean, I, I'm not luckier, but like I say that I'm luckier because I was physically taken away from it for a week. Um, also, uh, the pain. I think I try to help like emphasize that to so many people because like I like joked about it with people saying like I'm not gonna stop, I'm gonna bait more. Like I like when I heard the people on the news, like I was so ignorant. And then like I'm hearing and then I was in the hospital bed, like literally not being able to breathe. I mean that to me enough was like, Oh, I'm not doing it again. And also to say something about the second hand vaping, um, when people are around me vaping, um, and still do it. Um, I like it hurts. Like I genuinely, I can feel my chest tightened and like I can't be around it. I have to like use an inhaler, or, like take Advil or something because it. I definitely notice when people are vaping. Final thoughts. Um, Doctor Stout, would you like to start? I've, I've chatted. Final thoughts. So <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I've ranted plenty. Okay. <laughs> Doctor Marsh. I think I would wish that if we could kind of think about this in terms of prevention, um, because we certainly have to address honest concerns about treatment and what we're doing now, but as we go forward in terms of, of prevention, and I think that one of the key things is starting to talk about this before it happens. 
And I think that's one of the struggles we have with kids is they start doing things and they start experimenting and then we're kind of in a bad cycle. So even going into elementary schools before we hit middle school and just starting that conversation with families and with kids and, you know, bringing people like Anna in to kind of chat with them, that makes a powerful impact, I think, on children before it even starts. I totally agree, Permissions. Um, very necessary, and I think it's definitely a personality type. People go into high school saying, I'm gonna say no to drugs, or they go in saying, I don't care. Um, I feel like I've said a lot, but I think um, don't count your kid out. You don't know. You literally don't know. So. Just because your kid might be the straight-A student and the just doing everything right, that might be their one thing that they do, is that they make, because you don't know. I would support that. I've actually, two years, two years ago, so before it was even as high as it is, I was in an elementary school and I was amazed at how the fifth graders' questions. Um, they know, so start the conversation way young. Don't wait till middle or high school. It's already too late. The fifth graders are using the terms. Um, and speaking of terms, I feel like a small voice sometimes in an echo chamber, as often as you can, I know we're talking about all kinds of products now, so that kind of drags us in debate, but as often as you can, keep calling it e-cigarettes. The industry wants you to call it vapor. They want you to think it's not as bad, because that's their marketing tool for our kids. So the more we keep allowing ourselves to get pulled into, you know, the kids call it vaping, well, that's a problem. That's a marketing tool, so keep calling it e-cigarettes. Kids actually don't like cigarettes anymore. And this industry chose to be regulated as tobacco products, so let's hold them to it and keep using that term that it's tobacco. You know, they turn, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes all of us, so, and it's an effort for all of us to join together, the home, the schools, the you know community. It's a community effort. Um, I think that uh, all of us together, you know, what works is, you know, peers, counseling, peer things, you know, using Anna, you know, who's experiencing this, you know, who's experienced it, go back and help others who are experiencing it, using her, um, what she went through. I think, you know, the children, you know, the, the texting stuff, you mentioned texting, you know, maybe they don't want to get a call all the time. They text them and say, hey, how are you doing? You need help? Um, you know, those are things that we can, um, you know, use. And then let's not discount them. Listen to them, you know. Let's hear what they have to say and not, not count them out. Don't give up on them. You know, we don't. We shouldn't give up on our children. Very good. Thank y'all so much. How about a big round for our family?